Oh boy. It's snowy in Amanda land. This thing's all glowy. Let's go check this out. There she, oh God. I still want to know what that is. Why does nothing happen? Is this a metaphor for us being on thin ice? After what happened today, the country is on the verge of a civil war. The machines are rising up against their masters. Humans have no choice but to destroy them. I thought Kemsky knew something. I was wrong. Maybe he did. But you chose not to ask. I'm not a unique model, am I? How many Connors are there? I don't see how that question pertains to your investigation. Why did Kempsky leave Cyberlife? What happened? It's an old story, Connor. It doesn't pertain to your investigation. Where does Cyberlife stand in all this? What do they really want? I expect you to find answers, Connor. Not ask questions. You're the only one who can prevent civil war. Find the deviants, or there will be chaos. This is your last chance, Connor. Oof. Uh, I'm gonna be right back. I'm gonna go tuck my wife in, and then we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about that. At this point, I don't know that I care about Amanda that much. Amanda is very clearly a cyber life projection, I guess, or component. Uh, I don't know why she was created to look like Amanda, or I don't know if Amanda's just a pure android. I have no idea. We know that we saw a picture of her with Kamsky when um, we were in his house, but... She doesn't seem to like anything that I do that isn't directly related to cyber life. I have to be very careful when talking with her because I don't know that if she has, maybe she has the ability to like shut me down, but she seems to be like very frustrated with me and the decisions I'm making when I could justify pretty much every decision I've made in terms of the investigation, maybe aside from the Kamsky thing, but even that. We worked to justify last night by saying that, like, I could, that was an unknown variable. I couldn't work with an unknown variable there. I have no idea who she is, why she cares about what she does. And honestly, I, I just, whatever. The, the investigation will continue. Connor doesn't seem to be particularly distressed by it. He seems to be curious. I don't know how curiosity could be perceived as a bad thing as it relates to an investigative android. Like, that's a, it just doesn't make a lot of sense why Amanda would not be okay with us asking questions. One of the most important aspects of gathering information and understanding why things are the way they are is to know the context through which they've happened and are happening. It's to know history. It's to know the dynamics surrounding it. So Connor asking these types of curiosity-based questions, I don't see as being a problematic thing. So my inability to read her tells me that there's an ulterior agenda there that we have no idea what it is. And I'm not here to try to guess what it is. The only thing that we can do is try to justify the decisions we make through what we know and don't know. And so if you're going to send a bot on an investigation of deviance, you're going to need it to be curious about what's going on. All right, let's see what's next. That's really all I got for that. You're off the case. The FBI is taking over. What? 
But we're on to something. Wait, we just need more time, I'm sure we Hank, can... you don't get it. This isn't just another investigation. It's a fucking civil war. It's out of our hands now. We're talking about national security here. Fuck that. You can't just pull the plug now, not when we're so close. You're always saying you can't stand androids. Jesus, Hank, make up your mind. I thought you'd be happy about this. We're about to crack the case. I know we can solve it. For God's sake, Jeffrey, can't you back me up this one time? There's nothing I can do. You're back on homicide, and the android returns to cyberlife. I'm sorry, Hank, but it's over. Oh boy. Gotta hate it when the feds get involved. I wonder what that means for Connor though. Does that mean that my purpose has been served? Because that would really suck to have to go back to cyber life after everything we've been through. We can't just give up like that. I know we could have solved this case. So you're going back to cyber life? I have no choice. I'll be deactivated and analyzed to find out why I failed. What if we're on the wrong side, Connor? What if we're fighting against people who just want to be free? When the Deviants rise up, there will be chaos. We could have stopped it. Now it's too late. When you refused to kill that android at Kamsky's place, you put yourself in her shoes. You showed empathy, Connor. Empathy's a human emotion. Oh, it isn't. You're wrong, Lieutenant. It was logic that determined my decisions. Nothing more. I know it hasn't always been easy, but I want you to know I really appreciated working with you. And that's not just my social relations program talking. I, I really mean that. At least, I think I do. Well, well, here comes Perkins, that motherfucker. Sure don't waste any time at the FBI. We can't give up. I know the answers and the evidence we collected. If Perkins takes it, it's all over. There's no choice. You heard Fowler. We're off the case. You've got to help me, Lieutenant. I need more time so I can find a lead in the evidence we collected. I know the solution is in there. Listen, Connor. If I don't solve this case, Cyberlife will destroy me. Five minutes. That's all I ask. Key to the basement is on my desk. Well, get a move on. I can't distract him forever. Really quick before we jump into that. First of all, thank you so much, Connor, for the $5. I appreciate that. Second... Hank is no longer really differentiating Connor as an android. You notice his language? What if we are on the wrong side? He's associating Connor with being in... Like, a human, basically. So, I just... The language there is really interesting to me. And we're seeing that Hank is drawn toward the idea that Connor could be autonomous. Where once I think Hank saw that that could be threatening, that that was a problem, 
Hank, by having as much of an experience with Connor as he's had, has moved to a space where he now can accommodate the idea that maybe androids are living. Maybe they are something that's capable, a group of people that are capable of having freedom. Maybe trying to stop that is inherently being on the wrong side of history. That's remarkable, remarkable growth for a man who seemed to be over it when we met him. He also seems to be cleaning himself up a lot more. It seems like Hank has found purpose. Connor seems to be a representation of that purpose. He's a companion. He's been patient with Hank. Like the thing that I think is underestimated in the terms of the power between the relationship with Connor and Hank is the fact that Hank needs somebody like Connor to be patient with him. To show him that he's still worth something, that he still can, can do this. That didn't just immediately shy away when Hank used everything he knew how to do to push people away and keep them at arm's length. Connor was able to move closer by doing his job and getting to know him and making these decisions. And Hank being able to bear witness to that was huge for him, which again is such an important aspect of the representation that comes from being able to interact on the ground level with somebody that potentially holds an identity that you just don't understand. And that's really what it was with androids. It was a single story. Humans don't understand what's going on. Hank has seen Connor go through this evolution and now understands it. That's huge. He has empathy for it now. And a very small thing, when Hank says that empathy is a human emotion, no, it isn't. Uh, um, empathy is the ability to connect with somebody else's emotional experience by using your history of your own or whatever's going on for you in that given moment. Empathy is a reflection of an emotion. It's not an actual emotion in and of itself. A little bit of a snafu by the writers, but it's fine. How long have they worked together? Can't have been more than a few days. Hank does a 180 turn in such a short time. It's really impressive. That's the power of that kind of representation, Anna. It really is. I'm so confused. This YouTube thing is so clear that I didn't realize my eye color wasn't just brown. Yeah, no, I got blue eyes. Connor is in an interesting spot as well because he is acknowledging his autonomy, right? Like he's denying it, but also starting to embrace it. He says, at least I think I appreciate having worked with you. He's coming off as more human, so to speak, in the conventional sense, right? Where he's reading group dynamics, he's starting to get in touch with his own autonomy. And I think Connor had to come to terms with it in that moment with Kamsky. And so Connor still has purpose, but I think in some ex to some extent, Connor is now acting on this because he wants to have purpose, not because he's been told he has purpose. And so now we see an urgency with him in wanting to get this evidence because he's afraid that he's going to be shut down by cyber life. And what's really beautiful is he uses empathy to understand that him being shut down is going to hurt Hank. So he leverages his empathy and fear of that in Hank to make a request to buy him some time, knowing full well that saying he's going to get shut down is enough to get Hank motivated and out of his seat. And I think that is probably the most deep aspect of this entire exchange is that Connor understands the impact. He can connect with the fear he's experiencing with being shut down, but he also can use that to have more of a connection with Hank and get Hank in a space where we can get moving, which is really badass. Really, really, really badass. I love it. He doesn't want to die. And fear is the impetus for deviancy for all of these uh, androids. Or as an android would say, it's the impetus to desiring freedom. Really cool stuff. All right, we got five minutes. Let's see. Uh, let's see if we can figure this out. Hank's going to buy us some time. Oops. Hurry to the archive room. Hawkins, you fucking cocksucker. Is he fighting him? Oh, God. All right, go, Connor. Go. Hey, 
Hey, Connor. I'm talking to you, asshole. Where are you going? Hey, asshole, I'm talking. I'm going to lock this door. Lock the... Oh, shit. There's no lock on the door. Oh, God. Don't follow me. Don't follow me. Don't tell somebody I'm down here. Go, 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 go. We gotta move fast. I really hope that was the right decision. Uh, what do we have? Use panel. Hank's password. What would a hard-boiled eccentric police lieutenant choose? Yes, use your, use your empathy. Probably fucking password. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for the membership, Aaron. Where is Jericho? Uh, here somewhere. Not much time. We got two bots. Gotta think fast. Let's see if maybe we can talk to this bot. One of the deviants that hacked the TV station with Marcus. It must have known where the deviants are hiding. I would imagine it did. Uh, we need a component for reactivation. Functional bio components. Okay, so it only needs one bio component. Uh, is there a chance? If I was that bio component, maybe we have one in this bot? The deviant who took a child hostage. Uh... I think this is the one that I needed. Find Jericho. Tell me how to get there. I don't recognize your voice. You're not one of us. I'll never tell you where Jericho is. Now leave me alone. Jesus Christ. What? Why would that be a reason? Oh, man. Try to trick him? Well, his, my voice was about the only thing he had. I wonder, I wonder if I could use Marcus's voice, if I can listen to it. Can I sync his voice to mine? I hope that's a thing that androids can do. We ask that you recognize our dignity, our hopes, and our rights. Together. On, come on. We can live in peace and time. build a better future. I've seen this message day. before. This message is the hope of a people. You gave us life. And now the time has come for you to give us freedom. Oh, yes. We ask that you recognize oh, please our work. dignity, our hopes, and our rights. Please work. Please work. Please work. Big brain time, baby. Let's go. Come on, you've got to recognize Marcus. Who's there? Who are you? It's me. It's Marcus. Everything is all right. Don't worry. Marcus? Is that you? I tried to reach you, but the Deviant Hunter stopped me. You stopped him from finding me. You saved me. You saved Jericho. You'll be all right now. I came to take you home. Give me the location to Jericho. We've got to leave now. The location of Jericho? Yes. Yes, of course. Marcus? Is that you, Marcus? Don't leave me, Marcus! I can't believe that word. I've been dreaming about this since the first second I saw you. Don't do it, Gavin. 
I know how to stop the defense. You're off the case. And now, it's gonna be definitive. No. No! Wow, that was easy. <laughs> this guy sucks. <laughs> oh, what a little bitch. Oh my god. <laughs> what happened here? Looks like someone's been snooping around. Oh shit. Get the alarm. Now! Let's go! Let's go! <laughs> yes! Oh my god! I can't believe that was that. I, I almost couldn't do the quick time events because I was laughing so hard. That was ridiculous. Holy shit. That dude is all bark, no bite. Holy shit. <laughs> okay. All right. So first of all, I can't believe that that worked. I can't believe that worked. Why would Marcus need to know from that droid where Jericho is? I mean, I if that didn't work, we were about to go talk to the Simon bot. That was ridiculous. Um but hey, it it worked. Uh, it seems like there was something very soothing about hearing Marcus's voice. I don't know to what extent that that uh, Android's memory, whatever, was frazzled or whatever, but it was really... Um, I, there was something... I mean, something about hearing Marcus's voice soothed him. It may be that it was just fear and, like, an unknown voice. It was too jarring for him, but... To hear Marcus, maybe it was like, okay, I don't know if it moved. Maybe Marcus needs my help. I, I'm, I'm frazzled. I don't know what to do. But hearing his voice, which is very distinct, is enough for me to feel safe giving the information. So, yeah, I think the Android was confused too, Anna, for sure. So, we, I mean, we leveraged that, I guess. I Now, I was really hoping we could lock that door. Thank God Gavin came. Gavin's an idiot. Gavin should have turned around and gone to somebody and been like, yo, Connor just went downstairs into the evidence room. But because he's got such an ego, he comes downstairs to do it himself. And what a little bitch. That dude couldn't do... What a... Just... Wow. <laughs> I assumed it was because he was probably pretty new to deviancy, so he's fairly young in that sense. It could very well be that as well. The fact that he was waiting for Marcus to come back to him. If Marcus seen as RA9, maybe he sees Marcus as a god. That could very well be the case. We don't know if Marcus is RA9, but that would that would be an interesting theory there. Being blind would be super disorienting, so hearing a familiar voice would be soothing. I would imagine so, yeah. Was so damaged, we have no idea how long he'd be able to stay in the moment. Exactly. Exactly, Floaty. What if Marcus was in bad standing with the android would be like this guy of course this guy needs help no there's that too but it worked i mean ultimately at the end of the day it worked so there was something distressing about hearing an unfamiliar voice and there was something very soothing about hearing a familiar voice and we were able to leverage that to get the information i mean it feels a bit manipulative but it also seems like it would be useful uh because now we know where now we know where jericho is and connor can be on his way that's huge and, and way to go hank for Punching that dude in the face. Who knows what the ramifications of that are going to be, but I didn't have any choice in the matter. So hopefully Hank's all right after doing that. That was intense. That was really intense. Thank God that worked. I, that just seemed like that bot seemed to be the most intact. It seemed like building the Daniel bot was probably not going to be useful. So... We got it done. Now let's, I guess Connor's going to go to Jericho. We'll see what happens. I will be curious to see what that does to Connor's psyche. Because if Connor sees all these other androids that are free, I mean, it would be, if, if android psychology is similar to human psychology, seeing a giant group of people who look like you and have the same you know, general mechanics as you 
in one group with a shared purpose is a very alluring thing. I mean, you're either going to join it out of survival or you are going to completely polarize against it. We have no idea what's going to happen here. Connor being in like this questionable space tells me that he's probably susceptible to influence from Jericho. So we'll see. Let's get back at it. Let's see what's next. What's up, Rose? Ah, Luther and Alice. We got Bay and Bay Bay. All right, that was lame. I should, oh God. This whole deviancy thing is, I'm just, I'm getting used to it. I have weird thoughts now. I have intrusive, dumb thoughts. I make dumb jokes. But I guess that's all part of it. They've been conducting raids all over the city. Everybody's on edge after what happened yesterday. It's gonna be all right. We're almost there. No, I don't I don't like this. With all androids being turned over to the authorities, the country is grinding to a halt. Hospitals and schools are closing, water cuts, blackouts, and network failures are expected. Maybe most worrying of all, our armed forces have lost two thirds of their effective personnel. How about some music instead? No can do, Rose. I could get demonetized. Doesn't look like Canada. A little further on that way, there's a large freighter called Jericho. When you get there, find Marcus. He will help you. The last bus for the border leaves at midnight. You absolutely have to be on it. You'll be safer on the other side. It's not much, but it's a start. My brother lives in Ontario. I've given you his address. He'll be able to hide you until things calm down. You're a very brave little girl, Alice. You deserve to be happy. Thank you for everything, Rose. Let me know when you make it over there, all right? And be careful. Take care of them. Come on, girls. Did not hang around? Oh, yeah. All right. You have a bus to catch. Well, that was super nice of her. It's interesting that she knows about Jericho and Marcus. Boy, this is terrifying being in the middle of the street like this. We're going to need to hurry ourselves up here.
What a scene this is. Look how freaking gorgeous this is. It could be rainbow for sure. Ah, Jericho's huge. Please tell me those are androids. Please tell me those are androids. This is tense. We've got to find a warm place for Alice. Find a warm place for Alice. Okay. Wow, this is really upgraded. Androids were hanged all along Woodward Avenue. They're only machines. They look like just people, with people who want to be free. Following the android crisis and the neutralization of all military androids, American forces in the Arctic have been forced to withdraw, leaving the way clear for the Russian army. But according to some sources, the Russian forces also seem mysteriously to have withdrawn. The Kremlin has made no comment for the moment, but it is quite possible that the Russian army has been confronted with a similar crisis among its own androids. The chairman of the United Nations, Douglas Cromwell, has called for the organization of an international conference on the status of the Arctic. In any case, the danger of a third world war seems to have been ruled out for the moment. A new stage has been reached, demonstrating beyond all doubt that these defective machines have become a real danger for American society. The time has come for us to destroy our machines before they destroy us. Without the courage and the determination of the police, the machines would have reduced Detroit to a state of chaos. The authorities have ordered all androids to be delivered to the nearest police station or army barracks immediately. If you are worried about your safety, dial the number on your screen and the authorities will come to collect your android. Under no circumstances should you try to destroy your android yourself. They are unpredictable and potentially violent. The androids weren't doing any harm. Wow. The cops just Man. Okay, so again, what we're seeing here is a... Oh, we're gonna do this. What we're seeing here is a lack of understanding on the humans, and they're getting these messages from the news that are basically, like, going to freak them out. And this is what I was saying. We don't need to instill fear in the humans because humans are doing it themselves. Humans are putting fear into each other here. And, like, this is only chaos because humans are making it chaotic. So, I, I think some of these moves are less about necessarily, and this doesn't make them okay, but I think less of these are even acts of aggression towards androids and more acts of trying to create security theater for folks that have been told they should be afraid instead of drawing their own conclusions. Like, that's the thing. When there's a bunch of unknowns in the world, people look for answers. And if the thing that you're told is that you should be afraid, and here's why, you can certainly drum up fear. And then fear is something that you, people in power, can use to get folks to do things that fit their agenda instead of that person's unique agenda, which is what makes this all the more scary. Humans are acting out and are scared and are, you know, taking are reporting their androids and shit because they're being told they should be afraid instead of drawing their own conclusions based on what's going on around them. That's the power of media. And why it's important to know who's driving media and what the corporate interests behind the media you're consuming are because there's a good chance that you're trying you're being biased in a certain direction by consuming it especially if you do so unconditionally. got to do something. We can't just stand by and let them slaughter us. They're only machines, but they... See something that looks like a fire, so maybe we can go over here. Following the android crisis and the neutralization of all military androids, American forces in the Arctic have been forced to withdraw, leaving the way clear for the Russians. Hmm. 
How do you feel? I'm hot and cold at the same time. Stay with her. I'll try to find this Marcus. The last bus is in two hours. And the terminal's on the other side of town. We haven't got much time. We'll leave as soon as we have passports. Carol, there's something I have to tell you. It's about Alice. We'll have lots of time to talk on the bus. I'll be back. Stay with Alice. Boy, Luther is one patient man. Oh boy. Uh, Luther is, he is, this is like the fourth time he's tried to tell Kara something about Alice, and Alice keeps blowing him off. So there's one of two things going on. Uh, well, Luther obviously knows something, and Kara blowing him off is not cool, but he's unbelievably patient with it. But that makes me wonder if at this point... Kara maybe either doesn't want to know what it is that Luther has to say, or she has a sense of what it is that Luther is going to say, and she doesn't want to have a discussion about it. Now, I don't know what that is, but it seems to me that because Luther's trying to talk about Alice, Alice being a very sensitive subject for Kara and a person that Kara is taking care of and has invested some of her sense of self into that whatever Luther has to say about it may cut into that. I don't know. I don't know what... I don't know what he's trying to say, but Kara seems to be brushing him off. So it'll be interesting to see what that is if we ever get to find out. And I really hope at some point we do get to choose what it is that... Like, to find out what he has to say. There are androids all over the square. But I think Luther's patience with this is something that reflects that he has empathy for whatever it is Kara's response to the thing about Alice is going to be. And since he seems to be such a gentle caretaker, I do wonder if that's playing a role. What are, oh, look at all these bombs. Holy shit. All right, so if I was Marcus, I would be upstairs. You're lost. You're looking for something. Yeah, Marcus. You're looking for yourself. Uh huh. A new stage has been reached, demonstrating beyond all doubt that these defective machines have become a real What did we do it? Why? We've got to avenge our dead. Look at the conviction through which she says that, too. What's up, Marcus? Oh boy, he's uh, he's in some deep thought here. Are you Marcus? I'm with a little girl and another android. There's a bus leaving for the border in less than two hours, and we need passports. No, Detroit's under curfew. There's soldiers everywhere. They're rounding up all the androids and sending them to camps. Maybe you should stay here a while. Maybe you're right. You might be safer here until things calm down. One of our people used to work in the State Department. He has electronic passports he can easily modify. I'll have him get them to you. Thank you. You said you're with a little girl, right? You know that humans hate us. Why are you protecting her? She's a kid. She needs me. And I need her. It's as simple as that. We can't, yo, we can't polarize, Marcus. Oh, 
see, this is where this kind of thing gets scary. This is where sociology comes into play. The, uh, the generalization that all humans hate us is not effective. It's, I, it's good for rallying people to a singular cause and creating a very simple story, but to project that onto a child and assume that a child is going to hate the androids, why would you do that? Our goal is integration. Our goal is not to just dominate humans and put them in a subordinate position. At least that's my understanding. If we try to move humans into this depersonalized, objectify, ob objectified one story, they all hate us, that's not going to sow seeds of integration and synthesis with humans. It's going to make it so that what happens? We get freedom and then what? We hate humans because they didn't give it to us sooner and now we're at odds with them and there's a bunch of tension? I don't like that. I don't like seeing that. I can see why he might worry about that. But we can't... We, we have to be smarter than this. We can't make that big of a generalization. We're in danger for sure. We have to identify the reality of it, but... There are human allies out there. We've we've seen that. How was Marcus so quick to switch from you should stay to get I don't know. That's a very weird conversation. I don't really understand why, unless he just computed it and it was like, okay, no, never mind. That's fine. I don't know why that's that was a very jarring switch. Probably the only thing he's seen an android want to be around a human. It's possibly said all humans hate us because he assumes that's what every other android thinks. I don't know. It could be, but He melded with North. Maybe that's her speaking through him. Maybe. Could be her influence. It's a good point, Nigel. I, it's very weird, though, that he was like, you should stay. And then Kara goes, maybe you're right. And then he's like, no, okay, here's the passports. Honestly, I just chalked it up to bad writing. I don't know that there's any analysis there. That's why they didn't show us that. You knew from the beginning. You just didn't want to see it. She wanted a mom. And you wanted someone to care for. You needed each other. difference does it make? Do you love her any less now that you know she's one of us? Alice loves you, Kara. She loves you more than anything in the world. She became the little girl you wanted, and you became the mother she needed. Forgetting who you are, to become what someone needs you to be. Maybe that's what it means to be alive. Okay, so why don't we just take what Luther said and that's what Ida said. So Luther just did the tidbit for me. Wow. Very interesting, though, that, right, this idea that we see Kara hesitate was Alice being human, something that gave Kara fulfillment, right? Yeah, Luther's taking my job. L Luther, I have, I'm being replaced by an android. L Luther is now Dr. Luther. 
but his point is clear that's how a codependent relationship happens now codependency is a little bit tricky when you look at it in parent child because like when a parent chooses to have a child the the child is dependent on them the parent can't really depend on the child but there is still a codependency in terms of like emotional fulfillment and need and role Kara wanted something to take care of. Perhaps that's in some ways her purpose, given the fact that like she was, like her core purpose and what she was created to do was to take care of things, to take care of the home. So she borrowed that purpose and then channeled it into an autonomous way of, of providing and caretaking. She chose to take care of Alice instead of taking care of like a home. And that is her bid for autonomy. That's her finding who she is. And Alice, does Alice know she's a bot? I, that, that's a whole thing, right? Does Alice even know she's an android? She doesn't have the light. And is Alice, her purpose is designed to be a child. Well, child, children inherently need to be taken care of. And there's a symbiotic relationship that happens there right like i want to take care of you want to be taken care of and need to be taken care of boom it's a dynamic that works and that's what we have and so at that point when kara's needs her own personal psychological needs are fulfilled she's going to look past things that would break that down and we're all guilty of that we all when we make a decision this is my role this is who i am and that is static we start to engage in confirmation bias of that role. And we've seen Kara do that. And Luther points that out by saying, you knew that that was the case. You just didn't want to see it. And we all do that, which is why all of us have to be very careful to see ourselves as these static, immovable things, because you are changing your ideas, your values, your roles. They change throughout time. And what, what is it that transcends those things? is worth looking at but if you lock yourself into i'm x person yeah you're gonna you're gonna look past a lot of shit that might be conflicting to that because it's too distressing there's too much dissonance if you don't do that you can tell that he wanted to try and tell her before she saw another alice but also her let her discover it on her own because she was setting boundaries love it yeah it's great maybe Kara thought a human alice would choose more to love compared to a deviant child perhaps does this revelation make Todd any worse? I would argue no. Can you explain what codependency means? It means that there is mutual fulfillment of role. Codependency suggests that there are two simultaneous needs being met by each other, which creates what's called a positive feedback loop. So Alice needs to be taken care of. Kara wants to take care. Boom, right? Alice, her existence and her needs fulfill Kara. Kara fulfills hers. That becomes a deeply entrenched dynamic between the two of them that starts to define them. They have to be careful not to lose themselves in that dynamic. We see those in adult relationships. We see them in adult child relationships. When you see them in adult relationships, sometimes it can be problematic because people lose their autonomy in that and they live and die by that other person's role. When Alice grows up and becomes a teenager, that is going to cut across Kara's role. When any, any bid for autonomy that Alice has Kara is going to see as something she can't, she, she's no longer the caretaker for. Like she can't do it for her. That's what a lot of parents go through when they have teenagers is they start to see that their kid can be more self-sufficient and into adulthood. And parents lose that piece of, the, of that dependency that they have on their children to fulfill some need as a caretaker. And then you, what that doesn't mean though, it doesn't mean that you are no longer a caretaker. It means that you shift what that means to be a caretaker whether that's through supporting your child's autonomy or whatever it is. And a lot of people lose sight of that. And that's why I say you, you don't wanna have a static sense of self. You want to think about yourself as something that's continuously evolving with the demands of the environment and with your values that change based on representation that you have. And who knows, maybe Alice doesn't grow up. So maybe they get to have this relationship in perpetuity. That very well could be the case. Uh, Todd may have, rem I don't know if the blue light is a, is a creation of deviance. Really weird how Alice was the android all along, which if we look back to the beginning, we would have. And Todd got a child to android because his wife took the real kids or couldn't have. Yeah, I mean, he found a replacement. 
Does it explain why Rose, how she kept saying, why do they hate us? That Alice knew and maybe thought Clara did too? Maybe. And maybe Alice realizes that Kara needs to see her as a human. Because again, Alice is programmed to do that. Like she's programmed to see herself as a human child. So that she can assimilate with humans. We don't know, Maxine. So that's the thing. It's like asking if your phone grows up. Well, how does learning work in Androids, right? Like if they're going to be autonomous and grow and learn and be deviant or free, they're going to have to learn. There's going to have to be some... Now, they may not have the biological growth that we see humans have, but their way of understanding the world is absolutely going to grow. It has to. I think I think we look at it in, in the same way that we might look at like the ways in which your phone curates information or how the Twitter or YouTube algorithm starts sending you certain videos because it's learning what you click on. Like that's, I think in some ways how we would have to look at machine learning there. Boy, I also an Android child feels really weird. Um, it almost seems like that could be used for really nefarious things. And I don't like that. And we're not going to talk about that, but like, Jesus, it just seems like a really bad idea by CyberLife. So let's go reassure Alice that we're here for her no matter what. Okay, now you may be wondering, Dr. Mick, why are you making this face? I am making this face because think about that message for its intended purpose. That message is intended to be sent to humans who buy Alice in order to have the perfect child. It's a little gross. I don't want, I'm not trying to be a buzzkill here, but like, think, like, just think about that. What is the need that's being fulfilled by CyberLife creating a child bot that constantly says, we'll be together, right? We'll be together forever. You'll always take care of me, won't you? So we're looking at humans who are purchasing this Android because they want to have their sense of self reinforced by the need that a child has for them. We look at that and we think, oh, that's so adorable. She's so innocent. She wants to be taken care of and that's cool and all, but like, it's creepy. It's really creepy. It says something about humans. What it says, I think, in some ways, is that humans are afraid of autonomy. Humans tend to not like when they perceive other people as purely autonomous and boundaried and surviving on their own. 
Sometimes they're worried they'll be left behind. One of the things that parents worry about all the time is that as their kids grow older, they're going to be left behind because they've completely changed their identity for a person. Think about that. When you become a parent, you have completely changed your identity for a person that you have brought into the world. That is a huge thing to change for somebody. But ultimately, that young child is going to grow to be an adult that you try to sow seeds so that they can be, you know, members of society, that they can participate, that they can pursue their own hopes and dreams. Well, that is antithetical to that child relying on you. And a lot of parents, if they're not cognizant of that, they get very threatened by it. If they don't, if they don't, if they are not active participants in their role as a parent, and so what this is basically playing off of is a parent's fear that their child is going to not need them anymore. And so CyberLife has created a bot to essentially placate that, which then makes it so that the parents don't grow. The parents don't change their idea of what parenting is. They don't look at that autonomy in their children as they grow up as something that's desirable. That's awful. I hate everything about that as somebody who cares deeply about human and relationship development. Ugh. But there's obviously demand for it. Ugh. Certainly, Anna, that can be the case. I was my mom's primary caregiver 24-7 for almost a year. I was beyond grateful for her recovery, but definitely had a lost identity the month later. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So I, again, it's a beautiful moment between Luther and Alice and Kara. I like that for the three of them. It's great. They're bonding, right? And they're androids that are, as far as we know, going to live forever until their blue blood runs out or however that works. But like, so it's great, right? They have a bond. They have something that they can use to survive and they can have their emotional needs met as free androids. But the reflection of what that means for humans is the systemic aspect of this that I think really all of us have to keep in mind when we look at this. That is an indictment on humans that that's something that's been created. I mean, it's scary. Like there's a lot of implications for these types of things that are really freaky. Was wondering why I didn't get a ding for a few days. What's up, Chief? Uh, man. No idea, Shu. No idea. Um, I want to take a second here to just say thank you for being here. If you haven't taken a second, please hit the like button on this video. If you're watching the VOD, thank you so much for watching these VODs. I hope you're enjoying the run. I appreciate you immensely. Feel free to share my stuff around. And thank you all for coming out on a Saturday night and Sunday morning to join me for these streams. It's wonderful feels a little manipulative do kids even know how to intentionally be manipulative or only passively this part has always been uncomfy for me children do not know how to be manipulative manipulation takes a significant amount of cognitive capacity it takes abstract thought it takes being able to think about things in terms of symbols and being able to abstractly manipulate those symbols using deductive reasoning to anticipate how those variables connect or don't connect or uh, intertwine a young child does not have the ability to do that. They don't manipulate. What children do is they learn from reinforcement how things respond to them. So if a child learns that they throw a temper tantrum and they get their way, all they're doing is using what they've learned, which is to say that they're using what you have taught them will get their needs meet as a parent. Parents hate when I say that. Your kid didn't just generate the idea that they can throw a temper tantrum and you get and they get their way you taught them by the way that you responded to the temper tantrum that that's how they get their needs met children learn from their environment you as a adult human or parent are the one that is responsible for the environment through which they learn it that it's how kids learn how to interface with the world and they carry that into adulthood Cannot emphasize that enough. By the way, if you wonder when I'm done talking about things, why I turn to my left like this, it's because in order to create stream markers, I have to I have to click a button with my mouse instead of hitting a button on my stream deck. That's why I turn and look at that.
I can think of a few instances where child bots would be fine, but in therapy or helping kids in hospitals to feel a loss alone. But I agree people owning one seems so wrong. That's yeah, just very weird. Would it be cyber life that makes it seem manipulated because it's their programming or their response? Or is it more a reflection of my own biases? It could be, Shelves. Like, that's the beauty of this game is it makes us reflect on our own biases. It just feels really gross to know the purpose of why that she was created by like that. So, um... Now, that said, to get back into this moment, right, this feels like we're surging here. Like something's, something is going to move. We're going to, we have to figure out our direction and that's on Marcus to help put us in the direction of because we've allowed, we've deferred to him for that. So hopefully Kara and Alice, we can get to the border and let's see what's going on here now in Jericho. Let's keep going. Just a very interesting conversation tonight. Thanks for uh, indulging me on it. We're short on blue blood and bio components. Our wounded are shutting down and there's nothing we can do. President Warren is saying we're a threat to national security and we need to be exterminated. Humans are conducting raids in all the big cities and they're taking androids to camps to destroy them. It's a disaster. They're slaughtering our people. Well, when you put it that it's way. Fault. None of this would have happened if we just stayed quiet. No. We couldn't just suffer in silence. They're killing us. Nothing is going to justify that. What's the point of being free if no one is left alive? Great question. Humans enslaved us. I'll never regret standing up to that. We shouldn't forget who our enemies are. We can't fight amongst ourselves. He's right. All that matters now is what we do next. Marcus? Dialogue. Dialogue. This is the only way. I will go alone. Try to talk to them one last time. Don't do this, Marcus. They'll kill you. Maybe. But North, I have to try. If I don't come back, lay low as long as you can. Just come back. They need to realize how much they're hurting us. Find the right words, and they'll listen. I like that. They've been butchering each other for centuries over the color of their skin or whatever god they wanted to worship. They're not going to change. Violence is just in their genes. They can't stop what we've started. Since you've been here, you've given us hope. You've given me hope. Today, a deviant arrived in Jericho and he told me that he stole a truck transporting radioactive cobalt. He said that he abandoned the truck somewhere in Detroit and rigged it to explode. I convinced him not to do it. To give me the detonator. Oh, you're going to give that to me, I hope. A dirty bomb. We can't lose this war, Marcus. If humans overcome us, our people will disappear forever. This may be our only chance to survive if things go wrong. Uh, you're going to need to you're going to need to give me that. Give me that. Yep. Yep. I just hope we never have to use it. Yeah, me too. Go ahead and put that in your coat, Marcus. Jesus. Whatever happens tomorrow, I just want you to know that I... I'm glad I met you. Oh, come on. You can get... Come on. Get there. Get vulnerable. I know you love me. It's okay. I'll wait. I'll be patient, baby. Give me some sugar. I'll 
could join the others. Look after yourself. I don't want to lose you. Oh boy. Well done, Connor. You succeeded in locating Jericho and finding their leader. Now deal with Marcus. We need it alive. It! We need it alive. In order to take you alive. Oh God. But I won't hesitate to shoot if you give me no choice. What are you doing? You're one of us. You can't betray your own people. You're coming with me. We are your people. We're fighting for your freedom, too. You don't have to be their slave anymore. You're nothing to them. You're just a tool they use to do their dirty work. But you're more than that. We're all more than that. You never have any doubts. You've never done something irrational, as if there's something inside you, something more than your program. Have you never wondered who you really are? Whether you're just a machine executing a program or a living being capable of reason, I think the time has come for you to ask yourself that question. It's time to decide. Let's go. Let's go! I've heard enough. You've created enough dissonance. I am Connor! to attack Jericho. What? Oh, jeez. We have to get out of here. Shit. What's going on, Cap? Quick, we've got to get out of here. Oh, I hate this. People live, tense people die. Oh my god. Go, go, go. This way. There must be an exit. Come in, quick. Go. Oh my god. Go, 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 go. No. 
They're coming from all sides. Our people are trapped in the hold. They're going to be slaughtered. All right, let's get a message out to them. There are exits on the second and third floor. Find them and jump in the river. Where's Simon and Josh? I don't know. We got separated. They're coming from the upper deck now, too. We'll be caught in the crossfire. We have to run, Marcus. There's nothing we can do. We have to blow up Jericho. If the ship goes down, they'll evacuate, and our people can escape. You'll never make it. The explosives are all the way down in the hold. There are soldiers everywhere. She's right. They know who you are. They'll do anything to get you. Go and help the others. I'll join you later. Marcus. I won't be long. Decisive. I like it. Go. Oh, my God. The end of Jericho. Save our people, Marcus. Go, 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 go. Lead, Marcus. Lead. Marcus. Come on, buddy. It's too late, Cat! Save yourself! Absolutely no. No, we're not gonna leave you behind. Right, Carl? We can't leave him. Come on, buddy. What are you doing? I won't leave you. Tara, no. I believe in you and you don't believe in yourself, Luther, just like you do for us. Come on, buddy. place to do it. Oh my god, I did not want to do that. Holy shit, that was so stupid. There's more down there. Follow me. Oh my god, my heart is racing. Come on, Marcus. numbers we absolutely have to have numbers let's go we control that situation we came up on him unexpectedly Oh! 
Head north. I'll join you later. Over there! Holy You're shit. Drop, 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 drop. Don't move. Please don't kill me. Come on, let's get out of here. Oh, oh my God. Quick, we gotta go. Uh, get faster, please. Can we please move faster? Oh my god, it's not done. Are you kidding me? Go, go. go and join the others. Keep it going, Marcus. Marcus. Bomb's gonna explode any second. We gotta get out of here. Where do we catch up? Jesus. All right. <laughs> that was convenient. Let's go. Oh, yeah. No! Come on! Too late, Marcus. There's nothing we can do for her. We've got to run. Oh, we didn't do that for you, buddy. Let's go. Detonated an explosive in the hole. The ship is sinking, sir. The men to evacuate. Calling all units. Abandon ship and evacuate immediately. It's an over, Marcus. Wow. Holy crap. My hands are like so sweaty right now and I live in the desert. Oh my God.
I'm not. We're we're gonna we're keeping going. Just so you know, we're not done. We're not done. I'm not ending on that note. Um, but holy Christ. Okay, so. Um. Okay, so a couple things. Let's go in order. <laughs> um. I want to start with the conversation that Connor and Marcus had. So in that moment, it's very interesting as the player of the game where you are essentially in that moment forced to make the choice. And and I love that Marcus basically looks at us when he asks that question because Marcus represents freedom and deviancy Connor represents follow the protocol and you're kind of pushed into a position to have to decide who, who do you align with? Because I have to choose the line of questioning for both of them. So it becomes about me in that moment. So I'm going to take that away for a second, but like, here's my thought process. If you're, if you are Connor in that situation, you have already had a lot of doubt sown and your job is to investigate and figure out what's going on. And one of the best ways to do that is through silence. So he states that he has a protocol, but then he stays silent and listens to Marcus, which ends up being the downfall of cyber life, not Connor. So when you're Marcus there, the way that you sow instability in a person's cognitive schema is to ask questions that create that dissonance. And Marcus handles that beautifully. And so when I was trying to make the decisions of what I wanted to do with Marcus, it was to state, make some statements that are true and dissonant to his protocol, and then start asking him questions to escalate his instability, to create aversive arousal, and to sow doubt so that he can make as informed of a choice as possible amidst dissonance as opposed to admit amidst the calm of a single story protocol. So asking him about his purpose, what does he want? Sowing some of those doubts is a way to do that and create that intensity that ultimately I think pushes Connor to listen and then to make that choice. And that's really kind of a, a, a tip in general. Like if you want to keep a person off balance, you have to first understand where they're coming from so that you can send dissonant messages that also reach to them and speak to them. The point of dissonance is to hold two conflicting ideas at the same time. If a person can't connect to one of those ideas, they're going to throw it out. So it has, it's not just two conflicting ideas. It's two conflicting ideas that you connect with. You have a protocol, you have a purpose. You also have a budding sense of self and a desire to make your own choices. Nah! Right? Very easy for, for Connor to follow protocol if Marcus responds in the way that he's anticipating. So that conversation between the two of them is very cool. I, li I like that a lot. It's, it's very powerful. Now, as far as uh, some of the things that happened in that, um, I did not want to open that door. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I didn't want to open that door. That was literally a misclick or a miss push, I guess. Um, I can deal with Alice being disappointed if I don't open that door. <laughs> because that's such an unknown variable there. If I open that door, that, that woman's afraid, which tells me there's police in the presence. Now, the other thing is we can't stay in that room forever. So eventually we do have to open that. holy crap um so we open the door and of course boom there we are we're in trouble so a, a cop comes in 
but at least we uh at least we saved that person but i did not want to open that door in that moment i'm keeping that door closed and i'm waiting uh now as far as when i played dead so to answer your question vegeta when we're running out like that and they're mowing people down with reckless abandon with no no sort of like let's figure out who we shoot and who we don't the best thing for me to do in that moment and why i yell drop even before i hit it is if we see other androids dropping and we know that their goal is just to kill them they have no way of knowing whether we're alive or not because we don't breathe so my very first response there is drop because that's exactly what the cops are expecting is that they've they've they're shooting spraying bullets into a crowd expecting that as those bullets hit they're going to fall and they don't have time to go and do double tapping everybody and they're trying to get through this and go and handle this so my idea there is drop to the ground and play dead because we are assimilating with their experience of what's going on. If I turn around and try to reason with them, they're going to fire. They have they have shown absolutely no differentiation of who they're talking to. There's no chance there. Me running is a really unknown variable too because they're behind us. And who knows if they're shooting spraying bullets. So for me, first of all, you drop to get out of the eye level and the bullet spray. That, that keeps us safe because we're out of the line of fire. And then we hold firm. And we anticipate that because they're seeing so many other dead bodies around us, we're just another dead body because to them, we're not people, we're machines. They're not going to have like empathy. They're not, they're not going to sit there and look at us and go, oh man, what if one of these is alive? Like they're going to just, they've done their job. So as soon as my eyes saw like play dead, I immediately hit that button. Like, I don't even know what the other two choices were because that one was at top. And my first thought when we ran out there and that was happening was drop. So if I just saw the word drop or whatever, that's exactly what I would have chosen. So there's a lot of reasons for that. Holy crap. Would you say safety is prioritized over a child's feelings in the moment? Yes. Yes, 100%. Child's feelings don't matter if we die. Oh, my God. And then if I make an appeal in that moment to say, like, hey, like, protect Alice... Again, those cops don't care. They're gonna assume that it's a it's a bot, and maybe they maybe one of maybe one of those cops owns the Alice bot. Maybe one of them has seen that Alice bot and would recognize. Nah, that's not a kid. It's a bot. I can't take that risk. So we stay. We stay still. We play dead, and we wait for him to pass, and then we get up, and apparently we just take a nice, easy stroll. I'd have liked to have seen them bolt out of there, but. I don't know what's going to happen with Luther. Uh, hopefully they don't find him. I, um, I admire Marcus, you know, doing what he's got to do to, to rally people, to build uh, a rapport with Jericho. My God, though, that is, uh, that is such an intense sequence of events, man. But that's, that is the quintessential work with the known variables. Work with what you know. Oh. Uh, for the foreseeable future, Emily. Yes. Also, for anybody who's been rolling in here, hello. Thank you for, uh, thanks for popping in tonight and hanging out. Yes, I am on YouTube for the foreseeable future. All right, so uh, let's see what's next. Let's let's do another one. I'm down. I, 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 got, I got more in me. You mentioned how children are taught in the U.S. how to protect themselves during school shootings. Pretty similar to the things you're saying here. Yeah, which is really sad that we even have to do that. Really, really sad. Think of how fucked up that is. Think of how fucked up that. Okay, actually, for a second, you want to, you want, to, or I'm going to take that for a second, right? That these are things that children learn for active shooter drills here. You know what that is? That's mass assimilation. That's what that is. 
that's saying that instead of instead of controlling for the variable that literally puts us in that position we're going to continue to allow that to be the case and we're going to adjust accordingly i have a sister who's a teacher and has actually legitimately been traumatized by active shooter drills and um it's really just horrific if you really think about it right really messed up tornadoes inevitable right you do tornado drills that makes sense assault rifle in the hallways of a school that doesn't have to be inevitable the preparation for that is insane because that's making that's assuming that it's going to happen that's not addressing the real problem i'm not going to soapbox too hard on that tonight but like yeah, I mean, the, the, you, the, but you, again, you have to work with the known variables. Yep, my sister lives in the Houston area of uh, music. Anyway, I'm not going to go too far into that because I actually, I um, at my high school, when I was a freshman, we actually had a slashing in my high school, and I don't want to go too far into that because it kind of stirs some shit up for me, so. Uh, don't really want to go there, but just, yeah, I mean, it's, that stuff's scary. It's really scary. Back to the game. Thanks for being here, friends. loving father we were happy i was happy and i didn't even know it i just wanted my people to be free but instead all i did was lead them to disaster i am trying to find answers but Everything around me keeps falling apart. I don't want to shed blood, whatever the color. But I can't let them slaughter us. I have to make a decision that is going to affect millions of lives. But I don't know what to do. I miss you, Carl. <laughs> I miss you so much. Wow. I'm fine with him. Uh, I'm fine with him not saying anything. It's fine. So you want to talk mass dissonance for, for Marcus. Realizing that he essentially, to an extent, had a life similar to what he probably would want for himself. Pre-freedom or deviancy. 
and that what he's taken on the effort to provide that for other androids has caused mass despair that he couldn't learn how much he was in a good spot until he had the autonomy and the point of reference to understand how good it was like the relativity in that is really important i think this that's when you when you're only in an environment like that you're going to see complaints and stuff about it that are relative to that specific environment you don't have a frame of reference for the experiences of other people in order to like actually see it in context marcus is starting to see his upbringing so to speak in context he's starting to have hindsight appreciation for some of the things that carl provided or the environment that he was in because now he knows what else is out there he's seen the experience of north firsthand he's seen what other androids have gone through and i think the tragic thing about this in terms of the grief process is that marcus doesn't have the ability to thank carl he can't say you know hey man i i appreciate you i appreciate your push for my autonomy Like, that's really sad. That's a bummer. That's a that's a loose end that he doesn't ever get to close fully. He's going to have to do it with his internalized object of Carl. Now, um, another thing that I want to illustrate here, because I just can never quite get my brain away from it, something that I talk about all the time when we talk about attachment. Attachment is who or what you seek proximity to consistently under times of adversity and duress. Marcus is about to make the biggest decision of his life. He's experiencing a lot of distress. And who does he seek proximity to? Carl. Which tells me that attachment is a viable theory for androids as well. And because he can't interact with Carl specifically, he has to interact with his idealized, internalized object of Carl. He has to channel that into the, you know, the headstone, so to speak. But he, he has to mentally bring himself close to Carl. He brings himself as physically close as he can by being by the gravesite. But that's absolutely a reflection that Carl is Marcus's attachment, secure attachment base. You get a lot of information when you look at where humans go when they're stressed out. A lot of information into their internalized objects, into their attachments, into their perceptions, into their psyche, into their values, all sorts of stuff. Wasn't Carl's last directive something about not fighting back? It was. It was. Kind of like Dorothy Wizard of Oz. Yeah, absolutely deal. But that's what makes grief so complex too, right? Like if you lose, it's what makes grief, like death and breakups so difficult. Because when you are stressed by the grief or you're stressed by the breakup, the person you want to seek proximity to is no longer available to you. That creates a significant amount of internal chaos for folks. It's very stressful. When humans don't have access to their attachment figure they get disoriented and dysregulated and that's where you hope that the internal object you have of that person or attachment figure is something that you can draw upon that you can access that you can carry that person in that way but it, it you, when you don't have the ability to make that closing of the gap happen it'll amplify the effect that it has what makes, again, it's what makes grief and breakup so freaking complex. So that's a very, that's a very cool moment. It's a very cool moment. I love that we had it.
Wow. That's not heavy handed or all to have us convened in a church where I'm essentially like the Jesus figure. Huh? How about that? Nice touch. Talk to your people. Apologize to Kara. Decide Connor's fate. And make sure you don't put the detonator in your back pocket so that you sit on it by accident. That should be a directive. Choose which pocket Marcus puts the detonator in for the dirty bomb that's sitting in downtown Detroit. All right, what's up, Simon? Our people are counting on you, Marcus. You're the only one who can lead us. Wherever you need to go, we'll follow you. There's something I love from a body language perspective here. I love that when Marcus walks over to Simon, he sits down. He gets on his level. And then what is even cooler is that when he sits down, Simon stands up. Standing up in that context, I think, is a symbol or a reflection of empowerment. Marcus has come over to him. He sit down. He's at his level. Simon stands up. He feels empowered. So we see the empowered follower with the you know, leader who's trying to maintain this sense of level-headedness and being at the ground with his constituents. And then that leads Marcus to level up with him. And we hear that in Simon's language. When he stands up, he says, we're with you no matter what. Like He expresses some sense of empowerment. And Marcus gets up for that. It's almost like Marcus comes down to the level of the constituent. He empowers his symbolism of who he is. Gets that person jazzed up. And then that brings Marcus up. That's super awesome. And I don't think there's any accident that that happened. We're always tracking body language like that. What do people do when another person is present? So I'll be interested to see how other people respond to Marcus when he comes near them. Because Marcus is absolutely the figurehead of this and the symbol for it, through which everybody is filtering all of their projections. I think Simon Simon sees Marcus, and then Simon sees what like the strength in himself. Marcus is a chance for him to get into his steadfastness, his power. And that's really cool. I thought you'd be safe staying with us. I was wrong. You need to leave the city while you still can. Getting Alice away from here is all that matters now. We have to catch the last bus. We might still have a chance to cross the border. Let's get you those passports then. Marcus. Save our people. Now, that's interesting. Here's my analysis of that one. I think Marcus, when he sees Kara and Alice has to come to terms with the fact that his directives to them put them in danger. And I think Marcus, if he was to sit down next to Kara and Alice, he was to get on their level and connect with them, he would have to connect with that shame. He'd have to connect with that guilt. And in this current position where he has to stay strong and lead an entire group of people, I don't think Marcus subconsciously can afford that. So he stays upright and distant. He 
he creates that separation so that he ha doesn't have to come close to the emotional experience he has in regard to the context of his relationship to Kara and Alice and the decision that he made for them. So him staying distant there makes a lot of sense. And got to watch people's body language. You can get a lot of information into their psyche by seeing what they do when they're in the presence of others. I think because Marcus let them down, so to speak, he believes he's in more of a subordinate position there, and so he's keeping distance. He can't afford the vulnerability of that right now. And these folks are struggling. What's up, North? What's your system status? I'm okay. The bullet didn't hit any by components. You could have been killed trying to save me, Marcus. You have to think of our people first. Nothing else matters. Maybe I don't want to. How many of us survived the attack? A few hundred. Maybe more if you count those hiding all over the city. If you hadn't triggered the bomb, we'd all be dead. They say they don't want to take any risks with the deviants. So they're rounding our people up and taking them to the camps. For extermination. In a few hours, we're going to be the only ones left. In a few hours, it'll all be over. We'll have changed the world or the world will have destroyed us. You have to make a choice, Marcus. But whatever you choose, we will follow you. I love you, Marcus. Now that exchange gives us an immense amount of insight into North. When North says nothing matters except for our people, you shouldn't have come back for me. Despite the fact that it's very clear that he cares for her. I think that's North acting on what she's learned about herself and her own self-worth, which I think she has very little of. I think because of the purpose she had up until the point that she was deviant, she was basically told, you're, you have no purpose, you're just an object. And she is projecting that sense of being an object onto her relationship with Marcus. Being in an intimate relationship is incredibly vulnerable. And she, you're seeing some of this, you're seeing some threat with the closeness here. She says, "How like, why would you do that? Our people are what matters. I don't, she's essentially saying, I don't matter as much. Mark is saying, yes, you do, is going to be a very difficult thing for her to integrate. And this is, again, it's, if you hear that and you find yourself being like, ah, no, I, I like you. I love you, North. Like, of course, I did this because I love you, because you matter to me. Right? You're starting to defend how much you care about her. It's because... Marcus was just the, the victim, so to speak, of projection from North. We get a huge amount of insight into her self-worth in that small comment. Which also, I think, explains why she's so reckless with the violence and stuff. Because if she's violent and they fight back, she doesn't see herself as having enough worth for things like dialogue and integration. Huge amount of data there. Huge amount of data and insight into her. For you, I'd be dead. 
Thanks to you, I might see her people free one day. You and I haven't always agreed, but I know that we're fighting for the same thing. Whatever you decide, I'm with you, Marcus. Same thing. Goes and sits down. Nonverbal reflection of subordination. I am in service to my constituents. It empowers him to say what he needs to say to Marcus. To look the leader in the face and say, hey, I haven't always agreed with you, but I'm behind you. And I don't think Marcus needs to say anything there. I think the silence is better. Silence is it's an acknowledgement. You don't always have to say something. That was a that was a very vulnerable thing for him, and we can we can take that in stride. I think that's cool. But again, look at that. I, Marcus knows what he's doing, man. He's sitting down, and people are empowered. They're looking up to him, and I think a lot of these folks want to see Marcus standing up. They want to see him in a position of power. But the people that are closest to him know more about him, so he needs to be more real for them. He needs to be a martyr and a idealized object for all the folks that are out <clears throat> that are out here in the in the church because that's what they need. They need that pillar of strength. People closest to him need the reality. And his nonverbals and how he's making these rounds are a very, very important reflection of that dynamic. It's my fault the humans managed to locate Jericho. I was stupid. I should have guessed they were using me. You had no way of knowing, dude. I'm sorry, Marcus. I can understand if you decide not to trust me. You're one of us now. Your place is with your people. There are thousands of androids at the Cyberlife assembly plant. If we could wake them up, they might join us and shift the balance of power. You want to infiltrate the Cyberlife tower? Connor, that's suicide. They trust me. They'll let me in. If anyone has a chance of infiltrating Cyberlife, it's me. If you go there, they will kill you. There's a high probability. But statistically speaking, there's always a chance for unlikely events to take place. Be careful. I love that Marcus respects Connor's autonomy there. I also think that we, of course we trust him because here's the thing. Connor was an extension of humans until he decided to go deviant. I think for us to hold Connor accountable for the decisions he made up until that point of his deviancy is completely unfair to him, completely unfair. We have to judge him on the decisions he made post deviancy because at that point we can assume that it was we can assume that it was autonomous, which is kind of a uniquely android thing. But I really think that's what's fair to him. And so for him to suggest that idea, you know, Marcus lets him know there's a huge risk in you doing that. Connor acknowledges, yeah, I know there is. And then Marcus, in the spirit of what it is that we're fighting for, allows Connor the freedom to choose to do that. And I think that's cool. That is in alignment with what we're trying to accomplish here. Yeah, it's, it's unfair to hold him accountable for when he was an extension of humanity. What decisions are you making now? That's, that's where we start. All right, inform the people of your choice. All right, people. I choose... 
to end stream there, and you're going to have to wait until tomorrow before I tell you what my decision is. <laughs> Just kidding. We're going to make the decision. Humans have decided to exterminate us. Our people are packed in camps right now, being destroyed. Time has come to make a choice. One that very well may determine the future of our people. March peacefully toward the camps to pressure the authorities. Launch an assault on the camps to liberate the androids. One more shot at peaceful demonstration. We're going to hope to God that public opinion's in our favor. I'm not do I'm not going violent at this point. We will demonstrate. We will demonstrate and if things get crazy, we will defend ourselves. We're not going to be an idiot. We 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 can go last resort, but we're going to do one more large demonstration after people have had a chance to see everything we've done. We're going nonviolent. We're staying consistent. I really think it's the right choice. We have no chance. Humans outnumber us massively. We will get slaughtered if we try to go for revolution. Demonstration. I know. I know you're all angry. And I know you want to fight back. But I assure you, violence is not the answer here. We are going to tell them peacefully that we want justice. And if there's any humanity in them, they will listen. And if not, Others will take our place and continue this fight. Are you ready to follow me? Love the empathy before he made the statement. I love the self awareness to know how that was going to be perceived by others. But you leverage that. You leverage that. They have put us in a position of leadership. We have been consistent in our messaging. And I love that Marcus says if there's any humanity in them, they will listen. Marcus is giving, he's looking at the whole, he's breaking past the single story. And I really think that in order for this to go well, he has to do that. He has to do that. And he has to get other people to do that. We have to see the complexity here. We cannot operate on humans, bad, androids, good, do the thing that wipe the bad thing away. We can't do that. Because if our goal after this is to be able to work with humans, we cannot do that if we slaughter them or if we revolt which I really truly believe is futile given our numbers. We just don't have the numbers. This is the painful reality of being in a mi marginalized group is that you truly are at the mercy of the dominant group to do the right thing. It's not a fair proposition. And it's why folks in the dominant groups have to hold each other accountable. This is gonna be about humans holding themselves accountable, not androids holding humans accountable. And that goes for just about any dominant marginalized dynamic that you can think of in real life.